Blender 5.0 has officially launched today, and as you'd expect from a 5.0 version, this is a big release, with updates across nearly every major area, from rendering to compositing to grease pencil and even color management. Now I know that there are already a hundred videos around this release back when it was in early access, but now that it's actually available to download for everybody, I want to use this video to highlight five of the top features that game artists who mainly use Blender to build out their assets should really know about. Because for those of you in that group, this is an exciting update that unlocks quicker and more procedural workflows that I think mirrors where the industry is headed in general, which we'll touch on a little bit near the end of the video. Let's go ahead and get into it. The first feature I want to introduce you to in 5.0 is a brand new modifier that is an array, and it replaces the old array legacy, which was a little bit limited and I always found myself reaching for an add-on to replace its limited functionality. But now with the new array, we can do some exciting new things. So if we go ahead and add the modifier now, we'll go to add modifier, generate, and click array rather than array legacy, which is the old version they've kept in there just for now. So let's add the new one. And you'll immediately notice that we have a few additional options here. So we can, of course, translate them. We can scale them and, of course, rotate or we can add a new count directly in the viewport by dragging this plus. So if we move it out further, you'll notice that we have a relative offsets. We can of course change relative to a traditional offset where everything is more linear between the different uh, meshes. And then we can go to endpoints, which will let us directly set just where the endpoint is and it fills between there. Then we can adjust randomness, add in all the different variation, whether it's scale, rotations, whatever it is. We can add in maybe, let's say, a little bit more width on the y-axis. We can see more variation there. And let's drag it up. But in addition to this, right, we've used the shape line just to set this very traditional array. We also now have access to a circular array, which is incredibly helpful in so many cases as you're modeling out different assets, especially in hard surface. We can drag here on the gizmo to get more of a radius. We can use the same plus to increase or reduce the counts. And we can change it from full to maybe arc if you only want half to adjust the radius more close the arc or to open it up a little bit more and then to change the axis, which is all very cool and very powerful and definitely something that required an add on in the past. Another new addition is the ability to easily get it onto a curve. So it will disappear for a second, but if we shift S and go to curve, add in a Bezier, S to scale it up. And then let's go back to the cube and select curve object. We can either select it up here or select it directly in the scene. So let's select and you'll see, Instantly, we have an array across that curve. And of course, the curve is completely procedural and editable. So we can go in and move things around. Let's go to edit mode, grab one of these handles, make some adjustments, we can extrude it out and it'll follow. And the last shape that array has added is the ability to array along a transform. So if we go ahead and click this, go out, we can adjust along these various transforms, add some more. To give more rotation. You can imagine all kinds of applications for this. And I think this one is really fun and probably a lot of different MoGraph artists will like this, but I think that it can have a lot of modeling applications as well. So this one is really cool. I definitely plan to spend some more time uh, seeing what fun shapes I can get out of this when I'm doing my different, uh, different projects. So that is the brand new modifier. The second feature that I'm really excited about in 5.0 is the ability to finally scatter on a surface. There were of course paid add-ons for this in the past. And depending on if you're an environment artist, you might be doing most of your scattering already in engine. But if you need that randomness of placement as you're modeling, it is great just to have this baked into Blender without needing to pay for an add-on or to build out your own geometry nodes. So let's go ahead and look at what this looks like with the new modifier. If we go again to generate, we can scatter on surface with this ground selected and you'll see that it's placed all of the different random scatters. And if we come down to object, we can select some grass I'd already imported and you'll see we've instanced it across this landscape. And we can come in here and maybe adjust its density. Let's say go up to 10, mostly cover it. We can come down to transform and adjust different scales or alignments. We can adjust its offset a little bit if we wanna bury it 
little bit into the landscape, maybe just slightly. And we can randomize. Let's come down to randomize and expand. And let's set some offsets. Maybe we'll do a little bit of rotation, a little bit of scale. And then of course you can play with the random seeds. But you aren't only limited to instancing one object, you can also instance an entire collection. So if we come in here to collection, you'll see that I have three different meshes in this grass collection. So we can go to collection, like grass, and it'll choose all three of those and instance them across. Now looking at this, I think we need to increase the density a little bit higher to get more coverage. Maybe we need a little bit more scale in general. So I'll drag across these, just increase a little bit. And yeah, I think that looks pretty good. But this is, of course, a general universal distribution across. We also have the ability to create masks for this. Let's go ahead and close these. Go into masking. We can go into here. We'll select new. Call it uh, paint mask example. A new image. It clears it out. I'm in object mode, going to texture paint. You can see I've already painted in a previous mask, but if we come here, make sure you're on single image, come in here and look for paint mask example. Now you'll see it's a fresh new mask and everything is black, which means it's not going to be applied. If you tap X, we can go back and forth between white and black. White is applying the mask. Go to white and we can paint in, let's say, let's just bring it back here. You know what, let's do, let's cover everything and then we'll mask things out. So let's just, uh, Give it nice coverage. And let's get it like on a horizon line here and we will just paint out a few sections. Just to give it more breakup. I'll show you what this looks like. We get a quick little render. I know we're in Blender and we'd normally be doing this in something like Unreal, but just get a quick look at this from the horizon. Go into world. We'll use the new sky texture with multiple scattering, which looks really nice in Blender now. And let's go up to a render view. And yeah, here's a few seconds of rendering in cycles. You can see that just adding in a few spots gives it a lot more realism. So yeah, that is scatter on surface as a new modifier built right into Blender, which is amazing. And I recognize that as game artists, we might not be doing this type of foliage scattering in Blender, but you can apply this to anything you can imagine, whether you're building out debris around maybe a building as a hero asset or whatever it is, at least you have the ability baked right in without needing a specific add-on just to scatter. And another cool sort of bonus modifier within this second point is the ability to, instead of scattering randomly along a surface, you can now instance a mesh onto a specific element of another one. So I'll show you what this looks like. Let's say that we wanted to have this donut here and to instance something along it, maybe like a greeble, or if you're working on a building, you'd want things on the corners or on the edges whatever it is. So if we go up to add modifier and instead of going to generate and scatter on surface, we instead come down to instances and we instance along elements. We click this and then select one of our little meshes here. You can see that that mesh has been instanced along the points of this larger mesh. We can change this to edges or faces and then mask out random ones. We can adjust their scale, of course, a little bit smaller, or we can go from an object, which is just this individual object, again, to collection. So if we come into collections, we can go to Greebles, and now it is pulling from, if we choose pick instance, all three of these meshes in this Greeble collection. And we can go from random, let's adjust a little bit of our mask here. Then we could go from random index to sequence if we want, which turn on the mask, you'll see more clearly. The interesting thing is the more control you have here versus just the random scatteredness that you saw in the other modifiers. So it's nice that we have both depending on what you're building. The third feature that I'm really glad they added to Blender baked in is the ability to create a pipe from a curve. Before it required a little bit of a roundabout process. So the ability to just come in here, have a curve, go add modifier, generate, curve to tube is so incredibly helpful and nice and easy. So if we go here, we can of course adjust its scale. We can turn the caps on or off or change their type from flat round or to set a custom one. And then this is all just procedural and easy to work with, right? We can come in and hit tab, edit, can maybe extend it along this path. 
up a little bit. X. Of course, there are a lot of really good add-ons for this, like Cablerator, but just having the ability to just take a Curve and Blender vanilla and to give it a bit of a tube treatment for quick and easy projects is a really nice little addition. The fourth new feature I really like is the ability to lattice deform whatever it is you have selected in your viewport. Of course, before you could add in a lattice and then attach it to your mesh and it had some controls, but the ability to just come in here, have your mesh selected, shift A for add, come down to lattice and lattice deform selected is a really nice feature and it's already bounded to whatever your mesh is. And of course you can add in different resolutions. So let's say we want to add four on the V and W, we would have something like this. And then now that we have this lattice, we can procedurally make adjustments to this mesh rather than going in and changing its specific details. Now I personally don't use lattices that often unless I'm in a dire situation where maybe I merged a mesh but still needed to make changes. So I wouldn't use this all that often, but when I need to, just the ability to lattice directly on it and begin making changes in a few seconds. For example, if we were here, maybe we selected this, maybe we needed to give it a little rotation. Let's scale it up a little bit, rotate it around Z like this. That's something that would have been a little bit more hands-on and difficult if I had already joined everything together and I needed to make this like broad sweeping change to something. This is a really nice feature to have. So I'm glad that they added it and made it a little bit more accessible. Now the fifth and last feature area I wanna talk about is geometry nodes, which I know can sound intimidating if you haven't spent much time with them. But I think what they've done in 5.0 is actually the most interesting part of this whole release. And it connects back to what I said at the start of the video about where Blender is taking things. Now, if you look at the release notes, there is a massive list of geometry node changes, and this will not be a deep dive into each and every one of those. But when you step back, what they've done is largely make updates in three specific areas that I think are good to be aware of. And the first of those is that geometry nodes got a design refresh that makes them more approachable and easy to work with. For example, no groups now show up as a clean stack rather than a small icon up in the corner and getting in and out of node groups just takes a double click rather than a hotkey. Collapsed nodes are drawn more rectangular instead of pill shape now which really cleans them up and socket shapes have been redesigned to be clearer about what they accept. Bundles also offer a new way to organize data with three new nodes. Combine bundle which creates a new bundle from past in values. Separate bundle which extracts individual values from a bundle and of course the ability to join a bundle which combines multiple different bundles into one, which all together with these three nodes will ideally reduce some of that spaghetti that node systems have become notorious for. And then of course, there are a bunch of other little things like more readable attribute overlays and better tool tips that make the whole experience of working in the node graphs a little bit less intimidating if you're not deep in the weeds yet with them. The second area is simply a bunch of new nodes, both for power users and those just getting started. For example, for the power users, they've added SDF grids with a full suite of volume nodes. I am certainly not an expert in this area, but if you are interested, Ducky3D has a great tutorial showing you what you can do with these new nodes. Now, at the same time as they're adding in those more powerful tools for those a bit more advanced with geo nodes, they're also expanding the essentials library with new node group assets that handle common tasks you might be looking to solve when you're just getting started. For example, you can now add random rotations and combine and separate various shapes and select things by normals and boxes and spheres and smooth or displaced geometry. Okay, so finally, the third category of geometry node updates, and maybe my favorite one personally, is where they're starting to rebuild and introduce new modifiers in Blender that are actually using geometry nodes under the hood. For example, that new array and the scatter on surface and the instance on elements and the curve to tube modifiers that I just showed you, those were all built using geometry nodes underneath. So you get all of that procedural power without having to wire up the network yourself. And that saves you a ton of time of not having to build out that system yourself while still giving you the flexibility to dive in and customize or even just really to learn from it. And 
These approaches, making Geonodes easier to use and adding power features for the pros while shipping pre-built essentials for beginners, but also baking that procedural thinking directly into modifiers, feels like a really well-rounded strategy for making procedural workflows more accessible to artists. And I think that this is actually really important and signals where things might be headed. Just a handful of years ago, node-based systems and the power that they offered mostly lived in tools like Houdini or Substance Designer. They were powerful, but they were more for technical artists or even developers and tool builders in most cases. Then, more recently, we've all watched machine learning and AI swing to the complete opposite end of the spectrum with incredibly quick systems that can output things fast, but that always lack real control that we need as artists. And they might be billed as tools, but they still feel more like a procedural slot machine than a real workflow that is predictable and controllable. But now with Adobe teasing Project Graph at Adobe Max a few weeks ago, which looks a lot like Weavy that just was recently acquired by Figma, and Blender now doubling down on making Geonodes approachable, I think 2026 might be the year where these procedural systems actually start getting widely adopted by small teams and solo artists who are just trying to achieve more in less time. So if you wanna keep up with all of those updates as they roll out, and if you found this video helpful, then make sure to subscribe to the channel so you can find your way back. And check out the newsletter down in the description if you want these updates dropped right in your inbox. Until then, thanks for being here, and I'll catch you in the next one.